you're just a small cog in the machine, like for Magnus. If it was Jan's strategy during the candidates to play fast and put pressure on the clock. And so we lived on a boat for like three years. In poker, you call it EV expected value. And I think there are two types of seconds in the game. It's more complicated than that. Hikaru obviously also did a lot of things, but a big part of his chess development was just playing playing online. Some pawns will be sacrificed. So maybe you that are already working for Dean or for uh, Gukesh. Both. It's <laughs> the sweet spot. I would expect Ding to dig deep and a different Ding to show up. How do you prepare your team? I went to the gym with uh, with Vincent. That's the <laughs> secret to being a good coach. Just work for the best players and sometimes yeah. they win some stuff. Wow. Hey guys, I'm Greg Mastrider and today I'm honored to present to you the new guest of my podcast, Grandmaster, uh, co-founder of Chess24, former second to Magnus Carlsen, second also to Janni Pomnisch, captain of the German uh, Schach National Mannschaft, uh, banter blitz legend, godfather of online chess commentary, and of course the co-host of the Chicken Chess Club podcast, <laughs> Jan Gustafsson. Yeah, hi. hi, thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for joining in. Today we we are here in Astana, Kazakhstan for the upcoming World Rapid and Blitz teams. We are both involved. You are the coach. I am one of the players. And uh, it's a great opportunity to speak to you because I've been a fan for a long time. And let's start from the beginning. Mm, I've read and heard in some of your interviews uh, that you have a peculiar childhood story, that you were on a boat trip for a long time in the Mediterranean. I guess you were young and maybe don't remember all the details, but how do you think this influenced you? I'm not sure at this point. Uh, I've become like the joker, so I always make up a new backstory every time I'm asked. But the truth is, no, I was born in Hamburg. And when I was six, my parents decided to take the kids. I have two younger sisters on a on a boat trip through the Mediterranean. So we lived on a boat for, I don't know, like three years traveled everywhere, France, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Turkey, Greece. And then we settled down in Spain for another two and a half years. And I was like, when I was like 11 or 12, we went back to cold Germany. Yeah, I guess I picked up chess somewhere on the boat, but I don't remember details. I remember I had the, this little Mephisto Mondial computer. This is the, the 80s. I'm a very old man, so we didn't have the internet. What was the was ELO? I, I always wondered, what was the ELO of that uh, chess engine, prehistoric dinosaur time? I'm not sure at the highest level, what's supposed to be, 1600, 1800, like it could play, but yeah. Did you beat it when you were a kid? I don't recall, to be, to be honest, probably because I'm lazy. I was playing on lower levels and beating it, but I guess I, I beat it at some, at some point, but I don't, I don't remember, honestly, like. But you were Spend training and playing against this uh, old computer or also some of your relatives? Oh, my dad taught me the rules, but he, he's not a chess player and okay. I didn't play against uh, anybody else. So I, I guess, yeah, I was playing a bit with the computer and I read one or two chess books as a kid, but I only started playing when we came back to Hamburg when I was like 11. So I wasn't really a player before that. Do you think this influenced your ch chess style? Because uh, people of your generation, of course, you are not uh, that ancient, but uh, still yeah. most people of your generation uh, were brought without chess computers or at least without significant uh, uh, influence of chess engines. And you were basically taught by a computer. So that should have made you think like one or am I wrong? I don't think anybody can think like a computer. For humans, it's very tough to... Calculate a million moves per per second. Even though I don't know how strong this Mephisto was, but Tort is really, really strong. I just remember I got a hold of it at some point and I used it a bit, but it wasn't like I was playing, spending my days playing against this this computer pressing pressing the buttons. It's just yeah. The first memory I have of chess, I was playing a bit with my dad, and I had this computer, but I wasn't that much into it until we got back. To Hamburg, can I join a chess club? Because uh, people might think it's a bit ironic that now you are considered one of the greatest uh, opening specialists in chess in the world with uh, 
with the help of computers, more than uh, they, uh, computers, of course, which are a different thing, but still maybe, maybe there is some overlap here. Um, I wanted to speak about that as well. So of course, it's uh, many things you cannot uh, divulge because of like NDAs, confidentiality and stuff, but I hope you can at least uh, give me and the listeners some details about your work with, first of all, Magnus, and then with Jan. You are in charge of, or used to be in charge of their opening preparation. Is it correct or is it not the only area where you uh, helped them? No, every situation is different. With Magnus, I only worked during the World Championship matches and there obviously you have a, a team of seconds yeah. and you're just a small cock in the machine like for Magnus. <clears throat> well, not that small, like three, four people uh, usually, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, for Magnus, the setup was normally Peter Heine is his main guy who also goes to other tournaments with him and they're more or less in touch and he was in charge of organizing the team and like filtering the information that reaches Magnus. And for us, okay, you have some training camps, but we were in some remote location. Last two matches we were in Thailand, which I, I was much in favor of. And yeah, you click on some specific areas. Of course, you have an idea what you will play in the matches and most of the preparation ideally is sort of ready before the match. Then you react to what happens in the match and everybody has their tasks, checking this and that. Often it overlaps, you check something somebody else has already done or you come up with an idea and you give it to somebody else so everybody sort of keeps track of the information, but it's more of a team effort in very small, specific areas. It's not that I decide overnight, uh, tomorrow Magnus should play the Benko. That's, uh, <laughs> that's not uh, how it goes. But yeah, you, you refine some small areas and ideally try to find some ideas and come up with some directions. I would have loved to, uh, to see more Benko from Magnus. <laughs> could still happen, could still happen. Yeah. Uh, so um, um, I was wondering, uh, of course, uh, this is a significant part of your job as a second, uh, finding new ideas or uh, testing some some lines in uh, the opening with the computer to show to show your boss uh, later on. But also, I heard you mention, uh, given at least I think it was in respect of Magnus, giving him some pep talk, some psychological encouragement, something like that. Is nah, it is with it Magnus? That's uh, that's hard to believe. You you barely ever. See him during matches because we're far away, and there, yeah. Or maybe it was uh, in in respect of the German team. Uh, maybe maybe I confused. But is it uh, is is it part of your job, like to be not just a uh, an expert in openings, but also to be an expert in psychology of chess players? <laughs> I, I wish I was. My my own is certainly messed up. But no, that's what I meant. Every situation is very different. If you're a team captain for the German national team, of course, you can't go deeply into everybody's prep so there it's more yeah keeping an eye on everybody has what they need and they get uh, the help they need if they need to help in the opening or i know this guy is okay for for tomorrow or he can prepare mm -hmm. himself or somebody else is helping him and then some random problems uh, might show up but your job often is everything like someone gets sick you organize that they get some medicine or a doctor or sometimes you feel like okay this guy is good but he doesn't have enough <clears throat> confidence so you give a pep talk or the other way around you say okay keep it solid I mean everybody's different every situation is very different like well championship team for Magnus of course very different from being a team captain or being a second who goes somewhere with one player which is also a very different situation there a lot of it is just keeping company and going for walks and uh, dinners and that of course you look at some chess but often the pure clicking is not the main part of the job yeah, of course, I, I realize that probably otherwise anyone would, would have been able to click to click the button and see the first line of the computer. The, yeah. the answer is not just doing that, but finding something that will surprise the opponent, right? No, that's the tricky part. And nowadays, that computers are, are so strong, it's not like you need to find the truth and to spend a lot of yeah. time checking anything. Like the truth or what we consider the truth is pretty much there and it's there for for everybody. Everybody has strong engines. If we're talking candidates tournament or obviously world championship matches, that will say more or less the same things. It's not like you can 
come up with this genius move and your opponent doesn't understand how good it is because the computer isn't showing or anything. So nowadays, yeah, it's more about choosing a strategy if you are trying to surprise the opponent by playing sidelines, jumping around, or if you have your your territory and you know very well and you defend that. Or, yeah, <clears throat> if you try to go for, for main lines and can scare people that you might have a, an idea there that they haven't checked. Like, the information is there for everybody. It's not about gathering information, but chess is so big that no one can keep everything in mind. And yeah, every game is a different uh, universe, so it's hard to say, generally. How would you describe your approach? Uh, because you definitely know a bunch of things about how to prepare well for the candidates or um, the World Chess Championship matches. Otherwise, you wouldn't have been <laughs> employed by the top guys. So um, what, what is it that makes you, in your opinion, stand out in that? Because, of course, uh, you are a very strong grandmaster and have ample experience, but um, can you like uh, maybe clarify how, how is it that you are able to find new ideas? I'm, I'm not sure I am, frankly. <laughs> I, mean, you know, I don't think it's... It's that easy and it's also not necessarily my my specialty without trying to sound humble, but guys like Dubo, for example, or Jordan, who we had on the on the team in the last match, they are much more brazen with the new ideas and let's try this direction and that direction, while I'm more boring, big picture, let's make sure this works, let's make sure that area is covered. And yeah, I think you sort of need need both, but I never thought of myself as, as overly creative. Even though nowadays I think this ideas talk, it's a bit overrated. Like everybody switches on the engine and, okay, this move looks interesting. And then you keep clicking a bit and in the end everything is zero, zero, zero. And you try to find a line that is either surprising or you think would fit the boss well, because it also depends, of course, if you're a second on the playing style mm -hmm. of the boss. So one idea might be good for somebody, but not good for... For somebody else, I think it's all very individual, but it's really, I'd like to make it sound like a rocket science, but a lot of it is really just sitting there pushing buttons and okay, in this file, is this clean? Do we have an idea with why, what to do against whatever? Petra of the Berlin, normally the answer is no. So then you <laughs> start digging, but yeah, it's not, it's not like I have any tremendous secrets that I'm I'm aware of of how to find anything. Of course, with experience and if you have a bit of oversights over the typical areas that are discussed, sometimes it can get a bit easier to navigate. A chess is so big and it changes so, so quickly as well with new engines, new technology, that it's, it's never like you feel like you have a grip on opening, like every game is really a new universe. Right? Yeah, that's fascinating. It's interesting that you mentioned Jordan because he, he has also agreed to be the guest of the podcast. We will film oh. a couple of days later an episode with him. I will ask him uh, similar questions as well, but not, not only. So uh, my understanding was that uh, today, uh, watching the games of uh, top chess players in the candidates and in World Chess Championship matches, uh, my understanding is that this uh, the opening competition has become kind of like a meta game of trying to come up with something that will surprise your opponent, but your opponent knows that you will try to come up with something that uh, should surprise him. So he is trying to prepare for, for the unexpected. So uh, does uh, this factor of trying to get into the head of the opponent play a big role while preparing those lines? I think it can be, but as usual... <laughs> Like in poker, is he thinking on the first level or the second level or the third level, you can drive yourself crazy by going going up and down there. So I think at the end of the day, it doesn't affect you all that much, of course. And a lot of the top players have a very, very good feel because I also have played against the other top players. They have a good history for, okay, this guy recently has been playing that, but against me, it's more likely doing this. And that's certainly a skill being able to guess the territory that will come up. And then, yeah, it becomes a game because at the, the end of the day, you're trying to maximize your your equity, your expected value for that particular game. So it always is a bit of a guessing game. If I play this, I have no surprise value, but I might know it better or I'm comfortable or, yeah, this line 
I have a lot of experience or if I played this, okay, maybe we're giving up something objectively, but he will be surprised, which of course has a lot of value. And then, yeah, it depends <clears throat> really on finding that sweet spot that you're comfortable with and ideally surprising, but still feel at home. So it's always, there's no perfect solution. No one can play a new line every game and know them by heart and all the details and no one can play the same line, especially with white every game and is expect to get something. So it's mm -hmm. it's always a, a balancing act. But in the end, yeah, try to think about it. And yeah, in poker, you call it EV expected value, like because uh, all the lines you check with the computer, I mean, just will give you zero, zero in the end, which also in a way makes it easier to come up with surprises or you can prepare some small sideline. And if you click enough, which was considered back in the old days, nowadays you can probably make it zero, zero as well. But sometimes these lines, they're sidelines for a reason, because even though they might be zeros, it's much harder to navigate the territory. So it's not always a shortcut. But yeah, it's a it's a very weird universe, because yeah, it's much more of a guessing game <clears throat> and trying to maximize your equity than trying to find, oh, in this line we have plus one and we crush them out of the opening. That happens very, very rarely. Yeah, I feel that your poker background plays a role in, in feelings of such things. Yeah, I'm not sure, but uh, <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, it's humans playing against each other and you're trying to beat the other human. Of course, the science competition, like did we clean this line as the zero zero, plays a big role, but there, yeah, you can't do anything too special against uh, Stockfish or whatever engine you're using nowadays. Uh, I, I was reminded of a quote when you were speaking, uh, I think by Fisher, that chess is a matter of delicate judgment, knowing when to push and when to when to duck, I think, something like that. So yeah, <laughs> uh, looks, 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 looks similar to what you said. Uh, for you, what is it uh, when you do this uh, job of uh, working on openings, coming up with ideas? Uh, is it like... Uh, Competition, first and foremost, is it about sports or is it about like science? You spoke about finding some truths, stuff like that, or maybe it is art. Uh, what is it? I never thought about it uh, that much, but yeah, for me, even when I was more of a player, I was always more interested in the opening, the whatever you want to call it, the science aspect than in the art or Sports aspect, of course, is a combination, and I never give much thought if chess is like whatever a game or a sport or art. Like you can, anyone can view it as whatever they want. For me, I don't know. I mean, it's work at the end of the day, like uh, sitting with the computer, pushing buttons, uh, compiling files, and sending them them somewhere. But yeah, how you define it, I don't know. But of course, if you're a second or a coach or whatever, it's this sporting aspect is a bit limited of course you try sometimes to try to outsmart the opposition but it's yeah more doing research and passing on information in a way that's digestible than yeah this competitive thing you mentioned thailand uh if i recall correctly you were there with uh, jordan and daniel dubov right yeah for the match uh, against jan and laurent fresinet ah laurent fresinet yeah Sure. So you were there because of the time zones, right? To to be able to work while Magnus slept. Yeah, story. honestly, I always tried to <laughs> come up with a reason why being in Thailand is the perfect time zone, no matter where the match was. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> no, there is some some logic to it. And I think Magnus was maybe the first to figure this out that during World Championship matches, might not be ideal to have all your seconds there and have them work through the night and then bother you with random stuff. And in an ideal world, if you have like a six hour time difference, it makes your job as a second much easier, especially if you're somewhere in a nice climate, you just get up at 8 a.m., you have your breakfast, you work from whatever, nine till four, you send your files, and then where you send them, it's 10 in the morning, so they have time to check them through if they have a game at three and familiarize themselves and ask back for questions. And you're on standby if anything happens, but if not, yeah, you can just go for a for dinner at eight, go go sleep or watch the game and rinse and repeat. Well, <laughs> if you're there, it's much tougher like Magnus or whoever. After the game, you really have to eat, go for a walk, calm down a bit and then start thinking about the next game. Then it can already be midnight or 1 a.m. And if then you have to start working, it's much tougher than if you sleep and you get up in the morning and see, see what's up. So I think it makes a lot of sense. 
yeah, uh, the second option sounds really tough. Uh, is that what uh, <laughs> what you encountered in uh, Canada? These candidates? Did you work uh, well, over time for Jan? <laughs> No, without you, you can ask Jan about it. I don't want to give too much detail, but of course, he also has other sources of support. Of course, there, yeah, your schedule changes a little bit, and I think there are two types of seconds if you're on site: the ones that stay up after normally yeah, you have some discussion, as I mentioned, uh, around midnight or a bit earlier, let's say 10, 10 p.m. And then, yeah, you can either stay up and do the work then, or you can get up early. As I've been getting older, normally I've been yeah going to sleep at a more or less normal time, like whatever. So the younger one, guys one AM, were, were then, doing yeah. the, 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 the night shift. Yeah, no, I mean for for seconds in general, I think you have a choice if you want to click in the night or then you or you want to get up early in the morning. So normally I would set my alarm at depending on how much I felt I had to do 6 a.m. or whatever, then mm. work work a couple hours. Then you go for breakfast or whatever and try to pass on the information. But it's uh, neither is ideal because at night you might be too tired to do anything clever, but in the morning you might end up in time trouble if you underestimated the the amount of work and if you give yourself whatever three hours, but you feel there's more to do, you also don't want to have it unfinished. So there's no there's no perfect solution. But um, yeah, recently I've been on team getting up early, which tough. But what what can you do? Yeah, it sounds healthier, at least. I think <laughs> it's, so, yeah. it's interesting that uh, there is also the question of time trouble in uh, the, in the work of seconds. Um, I wanted to ask you um, to um, maybe compare two of your bosses, uh, Nepo and Magnus. Uh, obviously, you've worked for Magnus for much longer time. You can also draw those comparisons based on your experience in those candidates. So how would you compare them without divulging any top secret information? Everybody is different. It's hard to say, but as chess players, I think they're a bit similar in a way that they're obviously both incredibly gifted at chess, but also not super opening dependent in a way. Obviously, everybody needs openings, but I think they're more players than clickers. And also within top players, I think you have different players. And I think Magnus and Jan. They're good at playing most most types of positions, and there I just want to be ready to play and get a game. And because uh, yeah, that top level chess, you you need some some help or to do some work. That part has to be covered, but I don't think it's. I mean, obviously they work, but I don't think their passion is like clicking and creating files, and that also means they're not that trapped to a certain line or a certain style that they worked on. I feel like they can, yeah, they can play whatever because they're so good at chess and so universally you can give them something. I think for Magnus, it's always been a big strength that he's comfortable handling many different territories. With Jan and the candidates, it was a bit different. But yeah, he played a lot of E4, I think, in, in every game actually. Mm-hmm. And with, uh, with Black, okay, there was some... Some different stuff, but there were a bunch of Petrovs as well. So obviously you have your main repertoire, but I think stylistically, like they can navigate different territories there. It depends more on the strategy for for the tournament. But yeah, it's it's hard to com- compare playing styles too much because everybody's so so good, of course, at the top level. Of course, but everybody has uh, their own peculiarities of play. So uh, if we continue with that comparison, you named some... Uh, similarities? What are the differences between them? Does Jan still play faster? I should know these things. Because I know he's famous for playing super fast, but mm-hmm. I think he's slowed down a bit recently. But someone asked me if it was Jan's strategy during the candidates to play fast and put pressure on the clock, which we had, we had never talked about, so you, you can ask <laughs> him. But I, I don't think that was his strategy. But he played but yeah, the fastest. So, I've seen the statistics. Oh, okay. He was significantly mm-hmm. faster than anyone else. Oh, yeah, yeah, I wasn't aware of that. So it's uh, still there, which of course has pros and cons. It puts a lot of pressure, but it also leaves him vulnerable to making a mistake or playing too fast at some point. But if he doesn't, uh, of course, <clears throat> it can be extremely unpleasant for the opponent. You don't get time to think, and the guy is such a fast thinker that you're constantly under pressure, but it can also lead. 
yeah, to the occasional blunder here and there. I think, yeah, Magnus is not, he's not as fast, but he's more careful about, <clears throat> I don't know, avoiding mistakes, uh, but uh, yeah, not blundering, but he pays the price in form of not putting that much pressure. I, I think that's a sort of a difference. Then, yeah, stylistically, it's hard to say. You could argue Jan is more aggressive and Magnus is more technical, but that's just talk at the end of the day. Like all top players, they can handle all positions pretty well. So I think it's it's hard to say. This guy is more more tactical and this guy is more strategic. The game is more complicated than that. But yeah, I think Jan, what stands out is that he can calculate lines incredibly quickly while Magnus comes more from a Somehow he, he read all these books as a kid and somehow his brain put it together better than for anybody else. So I don't know how you call it. If you call it pattern recognition or knowledge or schemes, I'm sure Jan would, would disagree and say he can't calculate it all. But uh, <laughs> I mean, like it's, yeah, it's, it's nuances. But I think Jan is very, very good at calculating short lines quickly and has a good feel for, yeah, playing with the initiative and putting the pressure there. Why, well, yeah, Magnus is big picture. I think, yeah, more strategic that he tries to recognize situations or schemes or structures that he knows are favorable for him and less, once again, he can also calculate, obviously, but less, yeah, focused on bam, bam, bam. But yeah, it's it's hard to say. I'm <laughs> making stuff up as we speak. It's well, that was very, very, uh, very interesting. Uh, I actually have experienced Jan's uh, crazy calculation speed firsthand at the end of one of the podcasts that we recorded. It was in uh, in uh, Russian, but with English subtitles. You can check it out in the link in, uh, in the description. So we played a, a game, a casual game, and he cal calculated like a 10-move sequence uh, in like uh, five seconds and recited it <laughs> instantly. So that's that's what he is, always does. So this, this is crazy. Okay, you mentioned that uh, Jan and uh, Magnus both are in the group of the top players who do not overly rely on their openings, who can play anything and who uh, maybe stand out from some other players who are different in that aspect. Can you clarify that and uh, maybe give some examples of who the other group of players, top players are? No, it's all, of course, with very broad strokes, all top players know openings and look at openings, but I also worked a bit with Anish, for example, Giri, and he, yeah, I think, um, is more passionate about openings and uh, the the clicking part. It's insane. Like, I think I have a decent overview of our chess openings, but the amount of knowledge uh, Anish has in any line, yeah, it's was uh, very, very <clears throat> impressive. So, I mean, once again, it's... If you are close to 2800, you'll be pretty good in all areas of chess, but maybe people's heart sometimes lie, lie in different places if you're more of a, whatever we want to call it, more of a scientist or more of a sportsman or more of a problem, problem solver. Like, I don't know, Mamed Yarov mentioned that when he was growing up, he would go to the park before school and solve chess puzzles for for five hours. So I think your wow. background can like, <laughs> I don't know if that's a true story, but <laughs> I heard some. Five hours, man, before school. <laughs> yeah, sounds, maybe. Okay. <laughs> sounds like a lot. But I think your background, if you come into the game like I did by reading books and studying openings or by playing or by playing on the internet, I'm guessing, I don't know, I'm guessing Hikaru obviously also did a lot of things, but a big part of his chess development was just playing, playing online. Well, for others, it might have been different. Like you can see a bit maybe in their, in their styles. But once again, it's broad strokes because they're all pretty good at making chess moves. In my childhood uh, at school, uh, guys went to the park to drink beers uh, for several hours. <laughs> and my Yarov was solving puzzles. I, I'm still impressed. So, okay, Anish understood. He has chessable courses on practically every opening imaginable. By the way, uh, Jan has recently re released a chessable course. Uh, the link will be segue. Yeah, <laughs> the link will be in the description. Aggressive E4. 
so if you if if you feel like playing aggressively and solving your opening problems and creating problems for your opponent with some interesting gambit lines, especially not not just gambits, but I like the fact that you that you are a proponent also of some gambits in one e four. Yeah, this is, I like, this, this I like cool good stuff. moves. I like uh, moves that. Uh, put pressure and I feel a lot of chess amateurs are too excited about gambits all they want to do is play play gambits like uh, whatever Evans gambit uh, the Benko King's gambit, gambit. <laughs> and people always think I'm too dogmatic that I hate on all the gambits but uh, I basically I don't, just don't like bad gambits but if it's uh, if it's a way to put pressure I'm 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 all for it so sometimes yeah we have to give some pawns but if I have to choose we, we keep them but yeah in the repertoire some pawns will be sacrificed <laughs> uh, coming back to Jan and uh, Magnus, you didn't answer uh, the question of their similarities and differences as uh, not just chess players, but as uh, people you've worked with, as bosses, their management style, maybe something like that. Have you experienced any uh, similarities? No, but, uh, with Magnus, frankly, you, you don't get to see him that much. Like, um, <clears throat> okay, of course, uh, we've met at some training camps and I've... I've been around him on occasion, but uh, it's it's not like during the match I'm much in touch with Magnus directly because we're remote and the information went through through Peter Highness, so I can't I can't say very much other than yeah he seems to be pretty good at chess and normally he was winning these matches and you can claim it's because of my genius work on whatever random opening. So yeah, it's uh, I think it's more situation dependent, but I haven't been like to a tournament with Magnus alone that I could could really compare. And with Jan, he has a uh, less uh, no no not as big uh, of a team, I guess, not as big of a structure below him. Uh, or you, you should ask him. I'm not sure. I will. <laughs> <laughs> I will. But uh, how is he as a boss? Your personal opinion? Mm. No, we we, we <laughs> seem to have gotten along well. Of course, we, mainly the goal was. To win the candidates, that didn't work, and obviously that's the the main the main thing, and it wasn't accomplished. But overall, yeah, I can't I can't say anything too bad. I'm not sure if he realized, I probably realized by now, how little I was working and how much I was <laughs> sleeping at night. But normally, yeah, you also try to give them their space. And in a second, your main or big part of your job is not getting in the way of people's routines and habits and giving him his space. So if something, something's up, you, you're there and you're happy to look at a chest line or go for a walk or go for dinner or, and so on. But you also try to give people their freedom. And with Jan, yeah, often in the morning I would repeat, he would repeat lines and I would be clicking, clicking on some nonsense in case he needed it. But often, yeah, it's not like he's there giving me instructions full-time so yeah no i can't complain that much other than yeah the plan was to win and it didn't work and of course that's not a deal but what can you do so uh do you continue working for jan now or has your work stopped after the candidates how does it work with you guys i don't know i'm basically a a freelancer so uh, i'll i'll listen to anything i'm going to the Chess Olympiad with the German team in September, of course. And other than that, yeah, it's pretty much tournament by tournament, but there's no long-term contracts or or deals or or anything. We'll see how it goes. But mm -hmm. you know, the seconding world is also very secretive, so normally, yeah, you you don't share. So maybe you are already working for Dean or for uh, Gukesh, but both, both. <laughs> That's the sweet spot. That 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 would would be a great uh, <laughs> plot twist. Uh, okay. By the way, about the match, since we have uh, touched upon this, you mentioned uh, already that you don't think that uh, it's going to be a completely easy walk for Gukesh because you said in one of your interviews that Dean has shown us that he can even in bad form put up resistance. Uh, if we speak about the match with Nepal, but still, what's your you're a po poker player. You you can speak in, in terms of uh, probabilities uh, eloquently. What's your assessment uh, of probabilities of Gukesh winning or Ding winning? Depends which Ding shows up. Like the Ding we've seen recently in Norway chess or Vikanze, 
I don't think has a chance, not just against Gukesh, but against any top player. But there's still some time. And yeah, I would expecting to dig deep and a different thing to show up. But the way he's looked recently, you have to make Gukesh the favorite. Uh, I'm not sure. Because also it's a different stage and everybody reacts differently. But Gukesh seems very, very tough mentally, judging from far away. So right here, right now, with what we've seen from Ding, I would say, yeah, whatever, it's 60-40 Gukesh with yeah, the unknown being what shape Ding will be in. But of course, if 2018 Ding somehow mm -hmm. shows up, things, things could be different. But yeah, the, from the games we've seen, you have to make Gukesh the favorite as of today. What would your advice to Dean be? Should you, for example, should he ask you uh, as an experienced coach and second in World Chess Championship matches, what should you do to get back in, in shape in, uh, mentally and also chess-wise? I'm not sure he needs my advice, but also I'm really not familiar enough with his situation. You, you probably more than me. I'm not sure if he's spoken on the record. I guess he had some, some health and some mental yeah, some str depression. struggles in the past, but yeah. I'm, I'm not qualified to speak on that. And clearly it's not just a pure chess question or mindset question going up against this or that guy. So yeah, I don't feel qualified to speak about it. So I, I barely, barely know Ding. So I don't know. Still Ding, call me, call me. I, <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk. Uh, okay. Uh, we are here uh, in Astana. Um, you are preparing your team uh, for the tournament now. Uh, I've just arrived also and I've been preparing on my own and with my coach for some time. And uh, I have this unique opportunity to ask one of the best coaches and seconds uh, for advice as well. I'm not Dean, so I, I am here to ask. Um, what I, I know that it's very case by case specific, but still, what, what, what uh, in your experience has been um, the best advice to prepare for a tournament? Anna, what's your, your chess level? Pardon me for asking. Uh, uh, I, I play no uh, at the lowest board. Uh, my rapid FIDE is like 2000. And my blitz uh, feed is like 1900. My OTB is also around 1900. Uh, on chess.com, I am 2300 in rapid and blitz. So that's. And how do you work on openings? Uh, do you have chess base in the engine? You do your own stuff, or you buy books, or you watch courses, or none of the above? What do you do? All of the above. All of the above. But mostly, mostly uh, chess base, chess ball, and yeah, uh, revising the lines that I that I have in the files. Okay, then I don't think I can tell you anything. Sounds like you're you're more more than more than ready. Like no, it always comes down to how much time you have to invest uh, into chess and your chess studies. And of course, as we get older, often we have other stuff to do, or whatever, making money, studying, and so on. So it's hard to, yeah, put in put in the time nonstop you do as a as a kid, not because we consider work or prep for a tournament, but just because it's what you do. That's why most yeah, chess players get get their levels so young. But it sounds like you're here on a good track if you have a, especially in rapid and blitz. Like I'm an openings guy, so I would think openings are very, very important. If you know your stuff, you can play quickly and you can put pressure. I'm sure other people would advise you, yeah, solve, solve tactics, exercise and mm -hmm. so on. For me, it's always, yeah. It starts with, do I have my opening repertoire ready? Do I know what I want to do with white or with black in there? Yeah. If you have files and your courses, it sounds like, sounds like you're good. So how do you prepare your team? Uh, in also just openings or you, do you make them <laughs> solve any puzzles? I went to the gym with, uh, with Vincent earlier. Mm -hmm. So I'm making them work out very hard. Oh, okay. um, no, but frankly, on this team, like I'm working a bit with Vadim there. Yeah, it's mainly on on his openings and also getting him some some practice in the in the different time forms. But uh, for a rapid team tournament, I'm not gonna tell the best players in the world. Hey, listen, you need to work on whatever. It's, I think they're they're good to go. Like they're working 
on that stuff nonstop anyway. Yeah, you have an impressive team, to, to say the least. Yeah, yeah. Magnus, that, that, that yeah. helps. That's the secret to being a good coach, just work for the best players and sometimes yeah. they win some stuff. Uh, going to the gym, by the way, you mentioned also uh, in some other interviews that you also uh, try to keep in shape, go to the gyms during tournaments. I think in Canada you were a frequent uh, gym uh, Yeah, well, with, with, with Fiddler during the rounds. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, how important it is, in your opinion, uh, to keep keep fit for a chess player? I don't know. I don't think it's the the key skill, but I think it um, it helps. And I feel it's still a bit of an undercovered topic in the chess world, both fitness and nutrition, because obviously you can become a world class player with. Common sense, but without, yeah, like <clears throat> putting too much emphasis on this. But I think there might still be a few percentages by that. But I'm really, I'm not sure if anybody's ever done any big study on this subject or if anybody has any reliable information, like what body type, for example, is good for a chess player, mm-hmm. if, you, if muscles help you at all, or if they just take energy during the game. I think no one would argue doing cardio is probably better than not doing cardio, but like what the perfect um, body type is for yeah, different length of chess games and also nutrition wise at what time you're supposed to eat and what and so on. Like in other sports, I feel they have this Ample much research. more covered uh, while in chess. Okay, mm-hmm. You make up your stuff here, yeah, don't eat too much before the game and so on, but it's not like anybody really really has a clue. So I feel there's still a lot of room for improvement. But at the end of the day, it also depends if people people are into it or not. You can be pretty good at chess without without doing your your leg day. So I think it could help a bit, but we're we're all just just speculating at this point. It would be fascinating to 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 take a look at some research meta analysis of uh of various scientific papers, I hope in future they will, they will, will they will do this. They will uh, award some grants to scientists to work on this. Because I was fascinated by Magnus, for example, uh, choosing uh, uh, some, uh, I think, personal chef and uh, making adjust- adjustments to, to his diet, to his or- orange juice routine. And uh, I wonder if it helped. Yeah, hard to say. I think the chef thing is also near, normally during World Championship matches, especially if it's if. If it's a different cuisine from what you're used to, I think in, in India or whatever, just to make sure that he doesn't doesn't get any stomach problems or whatnot. But yeah, Magnus has also become the poster boy for like physical fitness and being in shape in chess. But we don't uh, really know if he's so good in chess because he's in shape or if he's just good at chess and in shape. And also, I think he's talked about it, so I don't think it's a big secret. I don't think he has a particular workout routine or anything. He's just a competitive guy who likes to play football and basketball or any sport. So it keeps him in shape naturally. But I'm also not sure if he has any big research or a scientific program, like what's best for a chess player. I guess we will have to clone Magnuson to, to, to make his clone uh, uh, lead an unhealthy lifestyle. And uh, oh, compare. Let's see, let's see how f- fat Magnus does it. Just. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think he'll be uh, also very strong, but maybe a little bit like like he wouldn't have won that game six against Jan. At the end, he would have gotten too tired. Yeah, we need different different versions. Marathon runner, maybe he's stronger. Could be interesting, but no, that's that's a problem. It's so hard to compare because not two cases are are the same, but common sense, I guess, would say that, yeah. Eating healthy and having a clue about uh, what to eat during tournaments and even working out during tournaments, you could argue, yeah, it costs so much energy or you could argue, no, of course, it should be part of your routine. We're just basically basically guessing in chess. Mm-hmm. Everybody seems to agree. Yeah. Going for walks that we learned from Botvinnik, that's <laughs> a good idea. But other than that, I mean, no one, I don't think, has, has it all figured out there. I wonder uh, about yourself. Um, do you personally work on your chess, not as a coach for others, but today? Like, do you solve puzzles or work on your opening repertoire for yourself? Not much. Like, I, I haven't thought of myself as a chess player for uh, for a long time now, like at least 15 years. But of course, I don't want to embarrass myself when I 
the rare occasions that I do play, which recently I've been doing a bit too much. So, no, like the only stuff I do is uh, on stream. Sometimes I'll, I'll solve puzzles or I'll play Blitz, but of course I'm mainly trying to, trying to entertain. Then, yeah, I prepare for games. And of course I have access to information, so it's not like I don't know anything, but it's completely different if you're an active player and you're working on your own opening repertoire or if you're doing stuff for, for other people. So no, not really, but also, yeah, life, life changes, you get older. And if I have, okay, still barely have above 2,600, but if it's 2,600 or 2,620 or 2,650, it doesn't change the world for me or anybody else. So yeah, that drive to look at chess for myself, I've lost a bit. Sometimes I'm sad about it, but yeah, no, I don't do it much. <laughs> Are you allowed, according to terms of your employment, to use some opening balm uh, that you found for, for example, your client in your own games? It's always a gray area, first of all, yeah. Not a lot of opening bombs around. Like in the Magnus team, it's always a running joke that Fresine would always use the, the preparation in every Bundesliga game. Which, <laughs> of course, it's just a joke. He, he would never do such a thing. Um, but no, it's always a gray area. But that's also why you want old old people like me a second, because it's not too scary that uh, I might use the material for myself. So it's always a, a trade-off, like uh, <clears throat> guys that don't play much, okay, at least they don't have this ambition to use it for themselves, but they might also be less into details in certain areas than active active players. So it has, it has pros and cons. But I don't think about it much, except I have some random Bundesliga game. It's usual I don't know what to play against the Italian, and I think, ah, shit, if I play in this <laughs> line, I might have looked at this with this guy, or if I play this line, I might have looked at this with this guy, and then I end up playing, playing one of the two and losing embarrassingly anyway. So, yeah. We have a tradition at this podcast. Uh, my guests play against me to demonstrate how more experienced players can crush an amateur. So if you are <laughs> willing to do that with time odds, that would be great. All right, time odds even. Oh, I didn't know. Uh, usually it's... The performance uh, part to this. Yeah, it, it's to make things more interesting as a show, as content. Usually top gems play one minute against five against me. Wow. If, you, if you're comfortable with that, we can do this or, or maybe some other format if you, if you want. I'm very old and slow. Four minutes against five. Maybe. <laughs> that, that would be too, <laughs> too one-sided. All right, all right. I'll take the one, but I, I can barely make 30 moves in one minute. Respect this man. Okay. So, okay. Time All to promote right. your <laughs> opening <laughs> course, <Good> probably. Luck, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oof. So you did, you did play this, <laughs> this gambit. Okay. You have to take... I'm out of book. Me too. Mm. You can think, have a lot of time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Nice gambit. I play it with white sometimes, actually. <laughs> uh. It's already very uncomfortable. <laughs> mm.
Tactics. <lacht> <lacht> Shocking. Okay, warte. <lacht> Oh, two seconds. Congratulations. Wow. I got lucky with that uh, tactics. Uh, no, the FE3 was very nice. I thought yeah. I was uh, doing well. but uh, Yeah, you were uh, definitely winning. Big comeback. Wow. Wow. Guys, it's the first time. I think the, I the first uh, <laughs> first loser on your podcast? Uh, I won, ah, I won actually against uh, Alisher Sulimeno, but it was in Russian. The guy who defeated Magnus, uh, mm -hmm. the young Kazakhstani grandmaster. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll you've you've trained me. <laughs> <laughs> you've trained me well. I, I felt this uh, energy from the top coach in the podcast. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Guys, subscribe. Stay tuned for the next episodes uh, and check out the aggressive E4 course by Jan because in the opening he got the a opening was doing well. Tremendous Just advantage. That, so the, this, this line is in the in the course, by the way. Yeah. Thanks again, Jan. See you in the next one. Bye bye. Whew, it was. Adrenaline. Well... <laughs>